Welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. This episode of the Aquarius Podcast is sponsored by Awaza, the global leader in water gardening technology. Awaza is a relatively new entrant into the indoor aquatic space, and they're doing all us hobbies a favor by stepping into an already competitive market and raising the bar with excellent products that have innovative features. One of the coolest features to the Awaza line of power filters is seamless built-in heater integration. So if you've been looking for a way to step up your aquarium filtration and hide your heater without going the sump route, then I highly recommend you check out Awaza's Biomaster canister filters and BioPlus internal filters. That's Biomaster canister filters and BioPlus internal filters. Learn more by checking out awaza-livingwater.com. That's O-A-S-E-livingwater.com. I will also have this link in the show notes for quick access. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Thursday, December 27th, 2018. My guests tonight are Eric and Kathy Olson. Eric and Kathy are an amazing hobbyist dynamic duo. Eric and Kathy are both members of the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society for over 20 years and have been incredibly active the entire time. Eric is the founder of the website thecrib.com, the first aquarium website created in January of 1994. I'm super excited to be recording this episode from their home in Seattle, Washington. So Eric and Kathy, welcome to the podcast. Hey, so actually, I just took out my uh, my earbuds, so this is all going to be kind of weird. Maybe I'll edit that out. Maybe we'll leave it in. It's okay. kind of a it's kind of a raw episode, so that's fine. Okay. All right. So so first off, the thing that I want to say is thank you guys both on behalf of like maybe new members or current members of Greater Seattle Aquarium Society because you both are like cornerstones to making that club work. I mean, there, there's a handful of people that are very instrumental in making sure that um, all of the programs, all of the contests, all of the speakers that show up happen, right? Like we have a really high member count, but there's just like a yeah. few people that really are the lifeblood and keep it going. And you two have been at it for so long and I'm just kind of like a drop in the bucket, right? Like I joined, <laughs> I like, I actually need to re up. So my, um, I'll have my, you know, one year membership, my first year of being a member of the, the GSAS is about to be yeah. up. I need to re up. Um, and so my tenure in the club is nothing compared to what you guys have been in. I mean, in, in what I've contributed is again, just a drop in the bucket to what you guys have. So all of the cool things like the audio video recording that we have of speakers, um, the exceptional quality, like thank you guys so much for doing that. And I am I hope that when I say this, I'm not one of the only people. Like I would hope people come up to every club meeting and say thank you guys for the work that you do. So hopefully on behalf of everybody in GSAS <laughs> that hasn't told you that, thank you guys so much for uh, making that all happen. And it, it I feel like it's a thankless job. Thank thanks. you. But yeah. there's your thanks. Like, big, big thanks. And I'm going to continue <laughs> to say thank you to you. Um, and you guys have been super warm and receptive to me. Um, relatively new person in the club. So I, I've been very thrilled to, to have interacted with you and been in your home a couple times and taken a, a tour of your fish room. So, And now you're taking time to be on the podcast. So thank you. Yeah, awesome. All we, right. We love enthusiastic members like you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, what what is your your so we'd like to start off with the origin story, right? And so now we've got a dynamic duo couple, so this could be very interesting. <laughs> I already know a little bit of the backstory, and it is definitely very exciting. Um, so who wants to go first on their origin story of how they got into tropical fish keeping? Let's see. You. I'll go first. Yeah, we have we have separate origin stories before we met. So, uh, I mean, I I grew up uh, in the 1970s. My dad had a couple of tanks that he. Uh, had interest in every so often and then he would have large year-long plus lapses of interest so you know he did things like kept an oscar in a 10 gallon yes, tank in the living the room oscar. Right? in a 10 gallon in a 10 oh, no. it was a 10 right and uh yeah so when i moved out to go to college i um i took one of the fish tanks with me and set something up in my dorm room uh, my last year in college and then when i moved up to seattle i uh um after a year or so, started getting into it as well. Do you do you remember what that was in college? What kind of tank you set up? A ten gallon tank with an Oscar in it. With the, oh, with <laughs> yeah. the, because I was trying to be just like my parents were at the time. Oh, yeah. nice. So that that's when you know I learned like you don't keep an Oscar in a ten gallon. You you can. The thing that was worse was the the guy at the fish store suggested that he put like a Malawi mbuna in with it. He said, "Oh, nice. oh this a little African cichlid would be a great." Companion to a to to an Oscar? No, no, you don't do that. And we're talking like water parameters, right? Like we're just kind of using Seattle They're tap totally water, different, right? right? Yeah, the Oscar yeah. really wants. It doesn't matter because it's Los Angeles. Oh, and, it's L.A. At this and time. L.A. Okay. Everything is hard rock. Okay, they should have you know just dissuaded me from trying to put an Oscar in there. 
But but it ended up like the 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 Muna was really nasty and just kept beating up the Oscar. Oh, so no. it was the Oscar was like this puppy, <laughs> and I ended up having to partition the tank into two pieces. So really, they only had five gallons each to each, and and it wasn't even a normal ten. It was like this ultra high, really thin. T- it was just criminal. Oh right? no, just criminal and. It was nice that the fish store bought the. They they actually gave me some little minuscule credit at the end of the year. I sold them back, uh, which I, would be unheard of today. I think, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But um, but then I went up. Uh, I moved up to Seattle uh, for graduate school, and I discovered um, the internet, and uh, was enamored by some of the people posting on the news groups. So, um, there was a, a whole group of like four or five that were very notorious at the time. And um, I got into that, and so I started keeping the tanks. And that's when I I did not find out about the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. First, I was looking for that, and I found the Seattle Aquarium Society instead and ended up volunteering cleaning fish tanks down at the Seattle Aquarium for two years before I found out about GSAS. Oh, right? nice. So, and eventually made my way to GSAS. Mm-hmm. So. And, and so, like, your... Uh, your journey as a fish keeper. So once you move up to Seattle and you're, and I would assume you're getting a bit more knowledge on, you know, what to keep, mm-hmm. um, what were the tanks that you were kind of gravitating towards? What kind of species, what kind of setups? Um, it was sort of, I, I've had a, like two paths go on at the same time, almost entirely since, since I started and, and primarily was planted tanks. So what I, the first person I discovered was George Booth, this guy in Colorado who was keeping, um, massive high-tech dupla type tanks and and what he did was he documented every phase of the tank starting from you know what i'm looking to buy and then each piece of the equipment and oh yeah here's the fish too and um so i was very much into that and trying to keep the planted tanks so that from the very beginning but um for some reason i also really enjoyed the african cichlids from lake tanganyika at the same time so I picked up a copy of Paul Lazell's book, mm-hmm. uh, The Cichlid Aquarium, and I was looking through it like a catalog, trying to find what I could, you know, interesting stuff to keep. So it's always been a dual track in that sense. Oh, very nice. And so, Kathy, what is your origin story? So I was raised on a dairy in Southern California, and we had about a thousand cows and multiple 500 gallon concrete water troughs and, and a mountain cabin up in the, ca- in the um, San Bernardino Mountains. So I would go up there and go fishing, and I would catch these bluegale sunfish, mm-hmm. and I would put them in a bucket, and then I'd catch catfish, and I'd put them in buckets, and I'd bring them home and put them in the water troughs. And then I'd go do tours around all the water troughs, and I'd see the mama catfishes and all the 20 million little babies. And same thing with the bluegale. They spawned in the water troughs, and I had all these fish tanks going. And, and these are like active, like being used water troughs? Yeah, the cows That's would come awesome. in, and they would drain them down to about five or six inches and then they'd be back up and they're like you know three feet tall of water so, so i feel like we, so we always say that you know you know your your fish are happy when they're breeding right, right? like yeah so, so something's going on in these water troughs we're like yeah this is oh this, this is good they, they went going for years oh, i mean my goodness. i'm in high school i started this in elementary school and they're still going and along the way i got some feeder goldfish and tossed those in some and then we discovered some fish were getting disappearing and we discovered that the ones with the wood slats over the top the crows were fishing through the holes oh. so we got rid of some of the wood slats and in middle school someone gave me guppies and i kept those at home in a bowl and I guess my mom's better judgment because my sisters had had green water bowls and she didn't want to do it. And I thought the fish died giving birth to a baby guppy. And so I tossed it in the horse water trough. And the next thing I knew, I had a horse water trough full of guppies off oh, of one nice. guppy. So yeah. that's how I started. And then I never kept tanks because I always thought they were boring. Um, they were just sort of bare tanks and not a lot in them. And in medical school, the dean kept fish. And when I had my review with him, I'd always talk about fish and diving, and I'd been assistant dive master and done a lot of saltwater stuff and and admired his tanks. And he decided, about the time I met Eric, he decided to get rid of his tanks. But that was actually after I met Eric. And, um, And so I said, sure, I'll take these fish tanks. And he gave me two different fish tanks. And so that sort of gets into our story, because I met Eric at a wedding in Oregon, but decided I came and hang up, hung out with him in Seattle. Then I was in Texas, and right. he brought me down to a Guppus Greater Portland Aquarium Society. They show. used to hold annual shows. Uh-huh. This might have been the first one that they did of a series of them. 
And I thought yeah. I'd humor him and go down there. You know, right. I'm like, sure, I'll go hang out. And I saw his fish tanks and they were really pretty. I'm like, these are extraordinary. They're gorgeous planted tanks right. and interesting fish and interesting only two stories. Of them at the time too. Yeah, and the tank was amazing. This I mean, is this is like the first story of where it's like boy meets girl, like girl falls for boy's fish tanks, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, yeah. right. <laughs> It's, yeah. not, it's not the car. It's not like the throwing football arm. It's, no, Eric had some good fish tanks. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah, they were extraordinary. I loved watching them. In fact, I came to study for my boards and stuff there and my final licensing right. exams. So, yeah, so I was sort of, I was like, they're really cool. I'm not going to keep them. Too much work. But, you know, they're really cool. And then we, we go down, so we go down to this convention. Um, not really a convention. It was like three speakers, kind of a couple of days on a weekend. Uh, on the way down, I think you were still pronouncing cichlids as chicklids. Right? I know. He asked right? me, he said, please don't embarrass me and call them chicklids. chicklids. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> on the way back up, she says, hey, I've got a bag of uh, Epistogram and Nice and I. What do you think about this? Yeah. So um, there was a, it was like a big change just over that one weekend. I heard her <laughs> Zadnik's talk on, on dwarf cichlids. And fell in love with them. I mean, just seriously in love with them. Do you I remember, mean, like, you too, but... <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, I, you know, and the, I, he would put up a picture of, like, jewel cichlids, and I'd be like, can we keep those in your tanks? And he'd be like, no. They're too big. Too big. <laughs> Not good with plants. And so I was sort of like, oh, what's good with plants? And, right. and then these niece and I came up, and I'm like, these are adorable, and bought a bag for 10 bucks. They were selling for like fifty to a hundred dollars a fish. Then. Oh wow! Right. So to get a bag, they just come for into 10, the country. Wow. Ten yeah. bucks was unheard of, and people were later appalled that I got them so cheap. But came home, yep. Yeah. So do you two secretly feel like we like we kind of like you guys owe the Greater Portland Aquarium Society like like extra kudos and love because of your guys' initial connection at their at their convention? Eh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah. the the. Greater Portland Aquarium Society was was the club to be looked up for it, 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 20 years ago. That was, I mean, they had the annual show. They it was. Were, it was a, that we, the, the Seattle folks that were on the board at the time, we used to go down there in a van. Like we rented a, uh, a minivan and made our board meeting uh, the night of their meeting. Oh, the nice. Time, so we could like drive down and see Lee Finley talk in Portland. It was, it was. Definitely a big deal. Nice. Eric and I would do a lot of We did trips, a lot of Portland trips. A lot of Portland trips where we'd get out from whatever, you know, me residency or him right. work and drive down there really fast and, you know, go to the lecture and then come back in the middle of the night, get right. back at 2 or 3 a.m. and then go back to work right. at 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning. What, what would you say would be the kind of comparable in, you know, 2018, 2019? Like, what would be that comparable annual event that you would put on par with what the... There is nothing like that anymore i mean they're not in the west coast at least mm -hmm. there's on the east coast there's still some things like greater chicago cichlid association okay has you know annual shows and so forth northeast council mm -hmm. northeast council i was yeah. gonna i was gonna throw that out there i was yeah. gonna say I it love... wasn't as big as northeast council though this was yeah. sort of like in between it was a, a smaller show mm -hmm. you know it had a small fish show in it and they brought in like three speakers not like five to eight yeah. speakers so. Yeah, I was going to say, now it would be sort of our club for the monthly in terms of speaker quality. You know, that's what Portland used to get. Because Portland brought in these awesome They're still bringing in amazing people for, down for, there. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. You know, they bring... But they would do these shows with all the fish takes and everything else. And I feel so. like I feel like outside of this episode, we need to put our heads together and think, like, how can we bring something like that back to the Pacific Northwest or the West Coast in general? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, I I mean, I think that we just bring that on a month-to-month -month basis now. We don't try to do too much. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that may have been what ultimately kind of killed that over in Portland was that there they were great shows, but nobody came to them. There was, yeah. Oh, really? I mean, that they, they stopped doing them because they didn't get enough attendance, and that was a real shame. Oh, it that's was, a bummer. Yeah, it was a real bummer. However, I mean, it's come up after sort of planning the AGA convention for this next May. Um, one of the board members mentioned, you know, if this goes well, maybe a couple, two or three years down the road, we could do a general one, um, just a general West Coast Aquarium mm -hmm. 
and have it extend to, more than just like the you know a, a one evening for a couple hours, right? Like actually have it like Saturday, like Friday yeah. night, Saturday That's during the, the day. The big mystery is 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 will people actually be interested in that or yeah. not, or yeah. do people prefer it in smaller doses? Well, mm-hmm. I've already I've already seen from social media. There's people that I've talked to, um, you know, Pleco Paradise and and various others that you know are in Chicago or different mm-hmm. parts of the country. That granted, yeah. their vendors they've already signed up and they're already you know super excited about AGA. Right. So um, it, it'll be great to see how how just how wide of a net, right? Yeah. Not, right. No, no pun intended, right? On a fish podcast talking yeah. about nets, but you know how how um, how far people travel to come to this event and, and just yeah. how. Um, just how cool it'll be. And so don't want to talk about AGA just yet. That was almost, I know. that yeah. was a great segue. But I, know. Like, <laughs> I thought the same too. thing. I thought it's no, not ready no. yet. I no, went no, down we're... there and did a month of school in Portland. I did sort of a, a, a month away and went to their meeting and went to their, their field trips. And right. it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, so yeah, I told it. There's a thing. Oh, yeah. They have a soft spot in my heart for that. Yeah, so. there you go. All right. So then let's talk about the crib. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, in the intro, I said this is the, the first aquarium web page back in January of 1994. I was right. the tender age of 10 <laughs> when you made this thing. So actually, I think I was nine. So I was oh. nine years old at the time. Yeah. Um, so, ha- I mean, how did it come about? Okay. So um, I was in graduate school and I was, you know, laboring away in the University of Washington Physics Department working on the degree and and a lot of that involves computer programming and playing around and basically the World Wide Web was coming into being at the time and the web was was designed by physicists right it was it it started at CERN essentially so we got involved a little bit in it just you know kind of learning materials and and um, at the same time I was trying to absorb all the information I could on tropical fish and keeping the tanks and so forth. And there wasn't really a good way to keep all of that kind of in one place. So I started just saving articles. Like people would do posts on these um, Usenet news groups and I would start saving the posts and I would catalog them into different, you know, different subjects. And um, that just morphed into a, a big directory of all of the different things I was saving. And then, I was like, all right, let's just put them online, essentially. And and that just kind of started turning into a website. I was like, oh, great, okay. And so I was, this was at work. This was at, at the UW Physics Department. And um, we were just running, it was, uh, it was an early Linux box running on a 386 sitting in our lab. Oh, nice. And it was also running the official pages for the, you know, UW Cosmic Ray Lab uh, at the same time. And the, the, the fish articles were getting more, uh, pop, more and more popular, and um, we started having um, actual articles written for the website as opposed to just saving posts from people. And um, it became at one point popular enough that my uh, graduate advisor told me I needed to get out. Right? He said, "I'm sorry, we can't keep hosting your pages because they're more popular than the official ones." So. Um, you know, it became, I had to move it to Caltech, right, where I had a friend at Caltech, and they had a friendlier department, so they, they agreed to host the pages over there, and we had to, we did what would be like a proto-Kickstarter almost. We, we um, appealed for donations to pay the $500 for a one gigabyte hard drive that we needed to put this thing on. Oh, man, how cool, because, yeah. I mean, you know, back then there's not like, you can just go to you know, AWS or like any, right. and like none That's of this right. stuff was out there, right? right? So you had to go with a computer science department or otherwise to, to host these things. I mean, you could host it yourself. And, and ultimately, that's what I did as well. After, you know, it was a year or maybe three years at Caltech. Um, eventually in Seattle, uh, the, you know, local phone company allowed you to, do, to put DSL in your home. And I, you know, was able to move it entirely into my basement. Basically. Oh, wow. Very, right. So, so. I, I have two kind of personal experiences with the crib that I want to share. The first, mm-hmm. and nobody knows this, I've never talked about this, is, is that I actually looked at your HTML coding on your homepage and was going to use that for the Aquarius podcast. And I was oh, just no. basically just going to change that, that code hasn't changed <laughs> in 10 years. <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it's so just... I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just so simple. It's just HTML, right? Like it's not right. like it's not what we're we're used to seeing today when we go to a web page. 
Um, so yeah, I was actually going to do that for the for the Aquarius <laughs> podcast because I knew I didn't like I had the Aquarius Podcast dot com and I wanted some type <laughs> of web presence, maybe just a picture and an email link or something. So I'm like, all right, let me let me go to this guy's website, the crib, and I think he's in the club. Maybe he'll be all right with me doing this if he ever finds out. And then I ended up I abandoned that and did some GoDaddy oh, stuff. Good. <laughs> um, and, and the second is, and I think a lot of people just don't realize it, but if you've ever Googled anything about an epistogramma. So as an example, uh, you look at the wet spot, right? You're on Aquabid, you see the wet spot is selling a certain epistogramma. You're curious to know more about that fish. If you Google that fish, like one of the top five results will probably be the crib. Right, yeah. So yeah. everybody out there, you're like, who's Eric Olson? What's the crib.com? You've probably seen it pop up. If you've done any type of dwarf cichlid or um, mm-hmm. I, I've seen other fish also pop up on yeah, there too in Google searches. So um, like you may not know it, but you've probably interacted with the crib in one way or another. Maybe not directly going there, but you've probably had Google resu- results come back for the crib.com. And the next time that happens, or just go and check it out. Like yeah. mm-hmm. it, it is so cool knowing that it's the first aquarium website. Um, you just heard the back story behind it talking with eric who created it i mean super cool so so how does the maintenance go for it now like is it just kind of no, not really any maintenance for okay. it I, it I, I i have to work on so many other projects that i don't really put so much on there so it's it's really kind of a time capsule more than anything okay. else these days when do you think was the last time you added any content to it i'm yeah it's been a while. It may been may have been ten years since okay. I had any real new. I mean, I edit content occasionally. We'll take something out or modify something. Has something has to be updated. Mm-hmm. But but that website proper really, um, you know, I don't really read news groups anymore. You know, this, it became a cesspool a while ago. Um, so th- there's so many other forums for that information. And you days. do a lot yeah. of work on the GSAS oh, website. Yeah, I'm doing now, tons of work archiving on archiving and video mm-hmm. editing. That's and, right. That's and, that's what ended up happening was I started working more on, on Greater Seattle Aquarium Society and the Aquatic Gardeners Association pages and I think when the the AGA started their um, aquascaping contest that was a whole new project and much more maintenance required on that one so that became the all-consuming um, projects at that point. And you wrote the code for that and the auctioneer programs for the yeah, auctions. There's and... a bunch of little, mm-hmm. little websites that, you know, that are a bit more advanced than, than the Cribs code bases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because looking at GSAS website and then looking at AGA, and I'm like, I think Eric... They're think, the same code. They're the same code AGA base as well. Yeah. They leapfrog each other. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of um, well. It makes sense. Like if you've already if you've already put all the work in, right? Like why right. not take advantage of that? And, right. Yeah. That's and right. I think you've got almost every GSAS article from their newsletters archived there. Oh yeah. There. No, that's and it started in seventy three, seventy four, something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Nineteen seventy three. Yeah. That's that's kind of been a side project. Right. Is the archivist, you know, the archivist hat. Mm-hmm. Right? So uh, and I've done that for three different groups right that was um gsas was the first going around and trying to find uh, old timers who had things stuck in their attics or, or their basement whatever people would bring me um crates full of uh, old newsletters and so forth and uh and this is even going back even to like 2000 i was mm-hmm. Scan, you know, batch scanning through uh, pages of newsletters and and trying to put something online for that. Well, not even online, just like on a CD-ROM at first, right? And then then migrate that to online. So I did that for GSAS. I did that for the AGA, and I did that for the Epistogramma Study Group as well. I don't even know if the Epistogramma Study Group exists anymore. That... It died, and now it's sort of having a resurgence Is in it? a different form. Yeah. Huh. So. Is yeah. that kind of like the Gadid working group, but for epistogrammas? Yeah. yeah okay. But it's sort of more of a forum posting group now. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. They were they were a little concerned. They didn't want to have their his, their twenty year history available online or on a CD ROM because people wouldn't buy their back issues. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's so sad to see people do this, and then the groups disappear, or the right. speaker that never wanted to be taped passed away, or you know some of those things. And then they're just gone. The yeah. material's yeah. just gone. You never know what what'll. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I really hope that there's a there's a continued shift. If if it is even a continuation of an existing shift, but just where we're more. Um, open with our information, right? Yeah. We're not trying to always keep things a secret, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, that's my secret recipe for this. Or I even know sometimes in that, you know, maybe I'll step on toes here, but I know certain speakers, um, you know, very much want to keep what they do guarded, right? And they want to right. have True. that as a way to get 
you know, hey, this is what I do. Um, right. Have me come to your club. But like, I would really hope if there's some really good nuggets of information there that maybe would help further a conservation effort or, you know, just bring more um, – better husbandry practices to the mm-hmm. hobby that it would just become freely available right and it wouldn't right. be on this kind of pay-to-play basis of you know bring me to your club and have me speak i and would then... just love to see it archived and even in their own library just yeah. just to have just in case mm-hmm. and there's a lot of epistogramma stuff on the crib because that was my passion that was her influence and basically. he um eric kept a lot of the african cichlids in the planted tanks and dwarf cichlids went good in there and of course i we got the niece and I home, and we had them spawning in a couple weeks, and which was crazy, and so excited. You know, there were video cameras and watching them, and then I collected more pestoramas and went to the ACA that year in New Orleans and came back with six tanks and six bags of fish and kept some fish that Eric had never seen before, and. Then I started trying to keep every epistogram out there and, and spawn <laughs> yeah. them. Collect them all. Yeah. I, this is why the crib has such a large yeah. epistogramma section. I, yeah, I would scour the local fish stop, uh, short stores looking for that lost episto in the back and actually got a couple fish from each fish store that had come in as contaminants that turned out to all be the same kind. And, oh, wow. and mm-hmm. no one could ID it, so that got me into reviewing all the literature. And then I re- after I reviewed all the literature, I got in contact with... Mike Weiss and went and saw him in person when I was interviewing for residency to discuss the current uh, nomenclature and how you name and divide epistos and how I thought it made more sense to do it that way. And he said they were looking at changing the classification system oh, wow. to do it that way. And and then I published that article because it's really easy to identify epistos once you start figuring out that they're in different groups and it right. needs to the be the morphological a, differences. Yeah, and so I love the classification system on it. So I got really into that and doing pictures for each thing, and then got involved in residency, and then had kids, and that sort of went away. But the article was funny because I got contacted from someone in Germany, and they wanted to republish it, but they also wanted to talk to me about my scientific you know philosophies on the name nomenclature of right. epistogramma can, can you give us like a thirty five thousand foot fly view of that classification and nomenclature or is that <laughs> is that is that going to do it no it's not going to do it justice it's it's um you know it's right now i'm i'm dusty on it because if, if not i'll have to come back here in a couple <laughs> months, and then we'll have a whole episode just about that oh it's it's fascinating i would have to go back and review okay. it but it was just like you break it down into the different complexes and then sub complexes but if you're looking at how two different naming, there were two different camps of naming. So one used subgroups and one used complexes and subcomplexes. And it has just blown up with the new fish coming into the hobby in the last 10 years. Oh, wow. So, and of course, this is all pre DNA analysis, too. Right. So, mm, so that's Mike changed Weiss everything. It's totally the expert on it, but it makes sense. And um, it's, it's just, you, when you follow it, you're like, oh, yeah, this has got the lapets and this has got this body shape so this fish will go in this this complex or the master eye family mm-hmm. and this one's got this body shape and that will go into platinia and so anyways spawn every fish i could i mean was doing things like filling fish tanks three quarters of the way full of oak leaves and and getting yeah. babies and spawning things that i was never supposed to be able to spawn even in our tap water you know they're like oh you can't spawn those unless you've got RO water and a pH of four. Well, if you fill a tank with oak leaves, you get them to do that. And my niece and I started moving a different set of niece and I was species maintenance for them. Ended up moving their babies and their eggs with their mouth. And they're like, Apistos don't do that. You know, they don't do that. And everyone would just disbelieve me at ACA about it. And would- I'm like, no, I've documented it. I've seen it. It exists. Which epistos were that? It was Nice and I. Oh, okay. But then Epistogram and Mouth Brooder, which is sort of part of that complex, came out later. And so there is a mouth brooding episto that was oh, yeah. about three years from discovery from when I was reporting that at ACA. Is that one common in the hobby? The mouth brooding Was episode? it Al- Altahuapa or something like that? No, that it, was a, it was a, it was, I think it's a different one. Okay. I was going to say. They're well, like more I said, common I'm a little, now. Okay. They're more yeah. common. I had mouth it in the club. Mouth was the unofficial name. I brought it into the yeah. club and sold it. And the problem is, is, you know, I bring these fish in and I have lots of fun with them. But then after a while, I can't sell all the fry. Uh-huh, so... Right. Um, and it's been a little bit, you know, with, I got 
ill, and so I haven't been able to do as much with the fish. And poor Eric, you know, he went from having two or three fish tanks to when I entered his life. Then we right. When this I is a, <laughs> forty fish tanks. This, this <laughs> is the marital conflict section of so, the story. So, right? so MTS didn't fully hit you then, right? So you no, had, we, you we, had a kind we, of a control. We eased into it together, right? Okay. I had three tanks before I met Kathy, and then within a year. We had, I was living in a one bedroom apartment and we had the entire kitchen had a rack of 12 tanks that were like 10 gallons on end. Yeah, so yeah. you could cram more of them in that way, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, and it's, and it's always, that's always a bit of a, a negotiation, right? Between um, wanting to put more plants in and put CO2 on versus breeding something in the tank. Oh, you, 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 you can't destroy my rare crit that I have in here trying to pull your fry out. So, yeah. So know. that's such an interesting dynamic that one, for, I think for most of, us, most of us, it's, you know, one one spouse is into the hobby. The other one is completely wants nothing to do with it. And we're right. always like, man, I wish my spouse was into it. Well, now here's a problem when your spouse does get into it. <laughs> Eric's mm-hmm. going to spit his water out, which is awesome, <laughs> is that you guys may not like the same things as much, right? Like, right. and so you end up having this conflict of there's only right. so many tanks. That's right. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. That's it's great. like wait, I could put this fish with this fish and move this that's fish right. there, and he's like, no more fish. And so, right. Yeah, we have distinctly different styles. Wow, on I that. never that that like, thought has never crossed my mind because right now my fish room it's just whatever I want in my life. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. really right. care. That's right. Right. <laughs> it, it changes everything. Like, Even mm-hmm. water, how you do water changes is different because I'm very cavalier about water changes <laughs> and how they how they're done. And um, and Kathy and is like, very much no, about no. You have to match more. the temperature. <laughs> this fish you can't change the temperature. You'll kill all the fry. Oh <laughs> right. man! Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is fantastic. All right, so everybody, so everybody out there that really, really wants their spouse into it, maybe we should be thankful that we're the only one in the relationship because then you don't have water <laughs> it's got advantages. Water change battles. That's great. It's and, got some massive advantages because. Um, I am kind of a an idiot when it comes to spawning fish, and pretty much everything I learned, I learned from Kathy. So you know, it's, that's so it's cool. It's a big deal. And he's got a fish room full of fish now that he's spawned. I mean, these rare rainbows right. that we were Weird only supposed rainbows. to be able to live feed, and he can he's got them eating flake and an tidy four eighty gallon breeder just filled with fish. Yeah. So. That's so cool. So and cool. of course, I, I do encroach on his plant hobby a little bit because sometimes I would see this cool plant and I would grab it. And one time I sort of snuck it in his 75 gallon tank when he wasn't looking, and he could tell you that story. Well, no, I just several months later, I was wondering why the entire tank was nothing but Val. Yeah. You know, I was like, how did this get in here? Yeah. Well, I yeah. was, I was, so I was just at the co op helping out with some, uh, some post Christmas orders, and I, I saw these tanks with duckweed, and I was thinking of you, Eric, and I almost oh. brought, I almost brought you some. No. <laughs> friends do not let friends have duckweed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is. Oh, oh. now, Kathy, before I let you off the hook, now I do want to know, I, ha- I have to ask you the hard question. What has been your favorite epistogramma? Oh, that is hard. I think it'd probably have to be the niece and I, though. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've had Penderu and some of the other ones in that family, and I just love the niece and I. And and I think, like, Wet Spot, that's a pretty... They have the niece and I. It's a pretty bread and butter fish these days for Epistos. Awesome. The one I most want to get. Yeah, that was my next question. What's your unicorn Episto? Epistogramma diplotenia. So when they spawn, you can actually see the eggs between their double lines, and um, I've had them. I got them once. They were like $100 a fish. Oh, nice. Had them spawning, but it turns out they have to have a sand substrate, and they have to have very specific water conditions. And I'm not sure I had the sand substrate in there yet, and I think I ended up putting a bunch of sand in there. And even though we washed it, the water still got cloudy, and I just lost them. And they're really high temperature pisto. Oh, so okay. you have to have the temperature high, the soft water, the acidic, like the 80, sand. 85 high. Or? Yeah, okay. and you have to be really careful with how you drop it because if it's too high, it'll kill them. So diplotenia is my unicorn. Okay, we could That's, probably do that now because we kept the soda cichlids yeah. successfully. So yeah, and they were and ninety I've, degrees. I've had f- wigglers. So I just haven't gotten adult fry yet. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So that's 
you know, that goes along with the Dichrosis film and Tosin, too. That's another one I've just always liked that I've wanted to spawn. I watched mm-hmm. them spawn in Eric's tank in the beginning. But they so don't both. hatch. Yeah. That's the problem. They yeah. spawn, they lay eggs, the eggs never hatch. Huh. But some that's, people That's the hard them. part. Do we, is it just a matter of fertilization, or is it they're just fungusing even after being fertilized? Well, it's, it's I think, again, a soft water a temperature issue and we've always had them spawning in community tanks hmm. and I, we're different fish keepers now than we were that's 20 right. years ago very different now. you know because this was back when we met in 96 so 22 years ago that I I we should give them another try oh i'd love to <laughs> so. so i'm gonna i'm gonna prod you every time i see you guys i'm gonna say did you get the is it diplo the diplotania diplotania yes they're rare in the yeah. hobby they're really rare and yeah. you're talking a hundred dollar a fish so yeah Occasionally, the wet spot will get them in, but that's the only place that's really ever brought them in. Other than Scott Dowd from the Rio Negro, they oh, brought okay. back some live ones that he spawned on the East Coast, and I didn't get them. I just there. had Scott on. I need to call him up and say, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, yeah. Kathy hey, wants diplotinia. We got to pull, pull the Project Piaba episode, and if you don't give me some of those epistogrammas. Oh, please, man. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd love to get them in the hobby here. Oh, love so cool. Love to get cool. them out. Yeah. So cool. Exactly. All right, Eric, let's put you back in the hot seat. So okay. you did something recently, and you gave a, a mini presentation on it at our club. Um, your heater experiment. Ah, the heater nerd project. And, and this is where it's like, Eric is just, like, clearly this guy guy has got some some serious like science computer chops in his in his background because i mean this thing i i, I mean i never, i would never think to do this so why don't you walk us through okay. what that was well this was just like yeah i just was like why not right so um i was i i do spend a lot of time looking up just random geekery and i was looking at um temperature probes and electronic monitoring and so forth and i found this is like five six years ago maybe and I found um, some, you know, this, this, these networked temperature probes that you can relatively inexpensively hook up and read from a, you know, you can read up to 256 of them on a network. You can run them on a single wire. So I was like, I think I need to hook up the entire fish room and the entire house on these temperature sensors. So I did, right? And I bought a whole bunch of these things on eBay from China and otherwise and invested a few hundred dollars and, um, and got temperature probes in every single tank in the house. And actually, I justified it to Kathy by saying, oh, we can look, we can plot the temperature in the tank over the course of these fish spawning and figure out if, it, if it's relating to the sex ratio at, or not, you know, and... Uh, it, it was good. Um, I bought it. Yeah, yeah. she bought it. <laughs> so, um, so, so I, I started writing software to keep to keep journaling that, and that turned into a sort of a tank journal. And then I, I I have it all kind of displayed up on a big leaderboard with you know all twenty whatever tanks that we have in the house with all their temperatures over the last day being displayed. And of course, that led into noticing that different heaters have different responses. Right, that that you got some of them um, are very very solid and that will keep the temperature kind of rock steady and another ones I started noticing oh this one fluctuates like a degree right the ch- the really cheap heaters have really bad characteristics there's a reason that you you know you pay more for something like an Ebo Jaeger heater or um, uh, what have you and so I started just kind of trying to to figure out what's the best heater out there what's the what is the unicorn heater, right? So I, I thought it was actually, I thought you, when it went into this um, experiment or this, you know, this this project, if you will, because you were so dissatisfied with the heaters that were currently available. Well, I didn't there realize... was that too. I mean, okay. it was, it, it started with just why not? And, and I did have some problems with some heaters that were sticking on. And one of the other justifications for putting the setup in was it, it was a, a way to tell if a tank went bad um, mm-hmm. that, that, I have it text me or email me if there's a tank that goes above the preset amount and so forth. And so we can actually see that. But it became like even more subtle than that because you could just see that some of the heaters are just zigzagging all over the place. You can even um, predict when some are going to completely fail because their their long-term behavior suddenly changes, mm-hmm. right? 
And now, and now, and if a heater mimicked, say, the fluctuation in temperature in like a given twenty-four hour period, right? Mm-hmm. We would probably be okay with that if it was designed. And they kind of do as intended. But oh, because you get the room, you get the room interacting mm-hmm. on it as well. Like right now, it's it's the dead of winter, right? We don't mm-hmm. have a lot of heat on the house. So if you look at the daily graphs on most of the heaters, there is a little bit of a there's a there's a daily cycle on them. They definitely peak midday. Um, and then they start, you know, they start dropping down after the uh, lights go off in the evening. So there is a little bit of that naturally in the tanks anyway. But so, do you find that within that natural, like, um, you know, daytime, nighttime uh, increase and decrease, that there's micro fluctuations within that's, that though of the heater? That's kicking due to on. the heater. That's right, the, that's right. a totally different thing. And so you've got some heaters that are really good about keeping it completely steady, and then you've got other ones that will go up a degree, then back down a degree, all in the course of an hour. Mm-hmm. And those are horrible, and I've gotten rid of most of those. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say, I think the most I saw was like three from a top to a bottom. Right. So. I, I no longer have those. Those have, have gone in the trash or mm-hmm. been sold off with the appropriate caveat. <laughs> is it, so is it just unnecessary to think that we like we should want heaters that, obviously our houses are never going to get below a certain temperature, but... We would want a heater, though, that would gradually increase in a 24-hour cycle, hit a pinnacle at like, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then drop and basically let it get to, you know, your predetermined low temperature. Like, is that, do we, do we, or do how necessary that is? Okay, so we would just, we just want stability. We just want stability, I think, is more important. Okay. I I think that's, that's better. People do program their tanks to do that. Some people do with, like, with CO2 and Mm -hmm. the planet tanks. Right, right. Certainly with that. That, that's kind of more, to me, feels more natural. Like, the, the, you got the day variation and you expect Mm -hmm. to, the CO2 to be used up during the day and then not so much at night. It'll build up. But it also depends on whether you're doing a lake or a river. If it's a small stream, it's going to be much more influenced mm-hmm. by the, the ambient temperature. What, so it. let's talk the heater technology that mm-hmm. was in the in the test. Um, they, they weren't all the same type of technology, though, no. right? Okay, so can you give a, a kind of a walk sure. through? And feel free to throw brands out there, man. Okay. Because if one brand's garbage, I think people want to know. Uh, you know it, <laughs> or at least what you found this is in a your tough test. One. Okay, this is a real tough one. Yeah, so so the traditional heater is is like a bimetallic strip that 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 triggers it on and off, right? So when it it goes above a certain temperature, it goes pop and it flips into the off position. And then when it drops below a certain temperature, the the switch goes you know pop back in and turns it back on. And and traditionally those eventually wear out because they every time they switch on and off, they arc a little bit. You get a little spark across that that connection. And so eventually they will stick. And unfortunately, they usually stick on rather than off. And that's but, regardless of if they're using a black opaque body or if they're using the clear glass right. body. Most of those tubular ones are going to be this design? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so what's what's come on the market, and, 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 and the difference between them is that some of them are very cheaply made and some of them are more expensively made. So the like the Eheims, formerly Ebo Jaeger, um, those ones are generally very well made, and so they last for a long time. So we still have our 20-year-old Jaeger heaters, oh, some wow. of them. You know, they all give out eventually, and, and that's where the, the monitoring helps to replace them at that point. But, um, but yeah, and then there's some smaller ones, you know, cheaper ones that just, you know, are very chatty and um, no-name brands and, and so forth. And then what we've got in, in the last um, decade or so are these sort of computerized ones that are using uh, a silicone, con- silicone controlled rectifier, or SCR. And so in, instead of having this, they have an electronic thermostat in it. And then they turn on and off the current electronically, so there's no moving parts. And that's great, right? Because there's nothing to wear out in that particular case. And it should be the perfect heater, but they aren't. And, and there, there are two major brands that, that do that. that. Actually, I guess there's three, right? There's, there's um, Aquion has one. It's a, they're, they're uh, a plastic case, so it's like the Aquion Pro model. Mm-hmm. Those are pretty good, but they have an analog dial on them, mm-hmm. so um, there's no real feedback. You have to use a you know a temperature uh, probe to to tell, and they even though they're completely electronic, they go unstable sometimes. Mm-hmm. So you know we've had a lot of those, and they're pretty good. They're a budget heater, they they work very well generally, but some of them are not so good, and then, so we'll see one degree fluctuations on one or, one or two of them. Then there's um, Fluval has one. I believe it's the E series, and that that's like a glass heater that's in a plastic cage, right? And um, that one 
its Achilles heel seems to be that you have to put lots and lots of water flow through it for it to work. And if you, you know, so if it's kind of in a very slow moving tank, it, it's not that Because it will throw a low, a low flow alarm. It does. Yeah. And I actually, I learned that from watching one of Corey's videos. Because <laughs> I, you know, I bought a bunch of these used over the years. And I think one new, I could not discern, discern from the instruction manual that it had a low flow alarm mm -hmm. at the time. But they're okay. They work pretty well. And then you got these, um, um, what is it now? Uh, the expensive ones. The cobalt. The cobalt heaters. Yeah. Yes, the um, the neotherm. It's just a repackaged uh, Aqua L Polish heater. The the neo heater, and those ones seem like the holy grail of heaters to me. Like, but they're really expensive. Yeah, they're like sixty five bucks or it's, whatever. It's crazy. Yeah, and it's got the it's got the big front dial. It's got a big it's front very dial. Flat profile. Right. Yeah. It's only got one moving part in the entire heater, which is a button you press to change the temperature on it. And guess what? I've had two of those fail in exactly the same way by having the button stick on so it jacks they, the temperature up to 90 degrees. I thought they had a, uh, a dial on those. There's a cheaper one. Oh. There's, they sell two different models. They, oh, they kind okay. of snuck. I, I mean, I'm not being paid by them, so I no, can say hey, whatever hey, I want. This, right is, this, is, this is Eric's <laughs> opinion. Um, they snuck in a few years after the, the Neotherm. They had another one that they put in that, that sold at a distinctly different price. And it looks the same way. It kind of looks like a heater that's been run over by a steamroller. But it's, it's still but expensive, it, though, right? It's not as expensive as the Neotherm. But it's not cheap. It's not cheap, but it has this... I, my understanding is that one still has the bimetallic strip inside. It doesn't oh, have the computer. So it's just like a regular heater, and except in the same package. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. I haven't tried one of those out yet. Um, but maybe they work better. And, huh. you know, but but I, I, to tell you the truth, um, three weeks ago, I just had another Neotherm just go out on me. I had to call Kathy from work and say, hey, pull the tank on 1A. It's overheating. It's going to 85 already. And, yeah. and yeah, so I've had three of those fail. And, and um, so I would think then, um, you know, for, for people at home that, you know, they, they can't do the coding or, or like myself included, like I can't mm -hmm. do the coding, um, you know, the hardware work, whatever it may be. But I want a way so that once it hits a certain temperature, though, I can have like a power shut off. What would be your right. recommendation? Or I guess how come you don't have one in place then? If this most well, recent example. The monitor takes care of that for me. So the the assumption here is that somebody will be able to get to the house in time before okay. it cooks the before it cooks the fish. So to me that's just as good, right? <laughs> that one of us will be there within a few hours. Mm -hmm. And and we get the alarm when it reaches eighty two, not mm -hmm. when it reaches ninety. Right. right? So eighty two is not unreasonable. Are are there any out there that would say um if if you know for whatever reason, you needed so you, you needed the shut off to happen. Like you guys are on mm -hmm. vacation. Let's yeah. use that as a good example. Mm -hmm. You're on vacation. Yeah. Nobody can come to the house. Right. Um, is there a an off the shelf solution that you would put in place or that you would recommend? Not for 25 tanks, but okay. but for like a just a normal regular aquarium. Um, I think the best thing. There's two two suggestions, right? One is classic, which is to just use two heaters that have lower wattage. Right, that is that was what was recommended to me back 25 years ago, and I still I still go with that. Although you know I've I've also found that the large ones like the 200 watt heaters are much more stable to begin with anyway, so oh. you know that's good. But um, so instead of like a 200 watt heater, use two 100 watt heaters. So yeah, if one fails, it will slowly raise the temperature, but it will not cook your tank mm -hmm. because the second heater will just turn off. Um, the other thing that you can do and and I have this on one tank, is so you've got one heater, but you plug that heater into a heat controller. Mm -hmm. So you invest a little bit more money. So like you get like a Finex controller. I don't know if they make them cheap anymore, but they used to make a really nice cheap digital controller. And I have like two or three of them on reserve in case something fails and I need to swap one in. So you set the the external controller for a degree or two warmer than you want it to be. And you set your regular heater the way you would normally do it. And then if, if the, um, the heater sticks on, it goes up two degrees and then the controller kills it. Okay, it, and, and, there, high. and as far as reliability of a system like that, there's no bimetallic strip. We're not worried about... The controllers are entirely electronic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they're not a holy grail either, right? Because some of the controllers, it's, it's all about how well they're manufactured. And I had one, it was one of these fancy titanium heaters. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even remember the brand of it, but it was not Phoenix. Um, and it had this, and I would never have even known this except that I have the continuous monitoring, but it crept up slowly over the course of a year. 
right? It was like a degree and a half after the first year, right? So first it was 76 degrees, then it was 77 and a half, then it was 79, then it was 80. You know, it was, it, it, it was like cooking a frog. Oh. In the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just going to stand there. They don't know what's happening. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> and then suddenly, why is this tank yeah. 82 degrees? And, and it was, and the, the, the controller said, oh yeah, it's 76 degrees. It's good. I'm doing what I'm supposed to. And I had to like dial the controller back. Okay. Make oh, it 74 wow. now. Okay. Right. And finally replace that whole thing. Have you talked um, to Dean yet? Cause he's testing out like at a new Italian, a uh, new to his fisherman at least. He's got yeah. some Italian branded uh, heater in there. Cause he's had his own trials and tribulations oh, yes. with, with Dean, heaters. I, I, I got shocked by a few of Dean's heaters. <laughs> he, he gave me a couple of them to try and figure out what was going wrong. And I, I, I got shocked by one of them, and I just like, no, I'm not touching them oh, now. Man. Buy something more expensive. Yes, yeah, so but he's got the same problem. He's got even more. He got tons of tanks, and it's there's not like an easy solution for that. Yeah, right. Yeah, to to kill it. Alarming. That's why I like alarming. Alarming yeah. works universally, no matter yeah. what's plugged in. Yeah. So I'm I'm heating my fishing right now, right? So it's my my new 10 by 12, roughly about the same size as Dean's. That's so, an even better approach. <laughs> well, so so here's my challenge right now is maybe somebody out there in the audience has the solution. So please let me know via email or what, however you listen to this podcast. But um, so I'm heating the room and I'm actually only using the dehumidifier now. So it's like a 70 liter. It's a mm-hmm. larger GE. It's way oversized for the space. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's actually consistently keeping it at about 75 degrees in the fish room but the problem though is that the tanks the top tanks are at about 77 78 mm-hmm. the middle tanks are about 75 and mm-hmm. the bottom tanks are around 71 72 yeah. Yeah. so then it's how do i like how do i get that heat back down to fan? the floor yeah so Maybe. so yeah. so a fan um or uh, put stuff in the top tank that likes warmer yeah, temperatures. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's the thought. And then I did actually buy an oil filled heater, um, but I I, I believe oh, I'm, wow. I believe I made the mistake of using uh, of getting one with a digital control because this thing wants to shut off. Like after a certain period, it just wants to shut off. And I don't know mm-hmm. if it's a fault of the brand, but I feel like if I just went with one that had the analog dial and just said, I want you to always be at 77 degrees or whatever it is, mm-hmm. it would just always stay on, right? Mm-hmm. And at least mm-hmm. at that temperature. So I think I think I made a mistake in going the digital route on that digital controller. At least I haven't figured mm-hmm. out what it is with that brand. Um, but yeah, getting those bottom tanks to be something more than just 71, 72. Yeah. And I do still have an army of heaters left over from when I did have multiple tanks in a room right. that wasn't yeah. heated. Maybe my maybe I just go and I just heat those bottom tanks with a heater and sure. um, you know roll the dice with that. Dick Al would be a good one to talk to. Okay, he said yeah. some really interesting fish room construction for unified heat. Mm-hmm. So we keep our our cares good deeds in the lower tanks that <laughs> so <laughs> they white... like to have seventy one degree heat. So in the lower tank, I've got uh, I've got cares good deeds. Yeah. I've got white cloud minnows. Yeah, um, yeah. There you go. I do have I do have plecos and guppies in another and in two yeah. bottom, mm-hmm. but I think I think it's a little a little cold for the guppies, yeah. so I might want to put a heater in there. Um, mm. So yeah, that's uh, that's you know struggles of a fish the everyday right. struggles of an aquarist, yeah. right? Fish say, world it, problems. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> seriously. Seen aside, more tanks, more problems. The fish room heater stuff. One we've called our fish sitter, you know, in the summer when we're at a convention or traveling and said, you know, our our tank's overheating. Will you please come over? Get to the house. At midnight, (laughs) you know, and she's running over here at midnight. Fortunately, she lives pretty close by. And Mm -hmm. then the other interesting thing is, is I've never had to dial 911 before. And Oh, you're going to tell this story? (laughs) He can edit it out. And and, um, the kids smelled smoke. And I came over and I smelled smoke by the attic inlet and and sure enough and it was getting stronger and i couldn't figure out what it was and it was a weird smell it wasn't it smelled electrical it wasn't like burning smoke and finally we dialed 911 and the fire department came and those guys' noses have been blown out by smoke they can't tell it and i could smell some downstairs but i couldn't isolate anything so they leave they don't they check the attic and it's fine your house isn't on fire and i go and i look at my email and eric's you I'm on a bike he, ride, meanwhile, on the Olympic Peninsula. I'm like day has four no in of Has no cell eight. coverage, <laughs> but has email coverage. And he's like, check the fish tank. It's dying. It's going up fast. Go, right. go, It's 90 go. degrees already. He's like, you haven't checked it yet. Go, go, go. <laughs> oh, no. and, and it's like a running downstairs. And look, and when I fed fish, I hadn't put one of the lids tied on. And the light that was sitting on top of the tank, the only tank with a light sitting on top of it, the light had fallen into the fish tank. 
Oh, no. And it is smoking. And I yeah. unplug it and pull the light out. And sure enough, you know, the tank's like 95 and all the fish are floating. And, um, yeah. you know, and then all the fish came back because it turns out they were just all electrocuted. So, and then gradually over the next several weeks, they, they probably they died they of died, copper poisoning. Probably <laughs> died from poisoning from the light that was, you know, the light bulb was actually filled with water. But it was his tank monitoring that clued us into where was the problem. Oh, my goodness. That could have been this such a... Yeah, we could have had no worse house. outcome. My right. goodness, right. I know, I know. And then I called the fire department and said, "You know how you guys were admiring those fish tanks downstairs? Well, the light fell in one of them, and that was what the smell was. They were down there, and the, they one of them went it. down there yeah. and missed it. Oh so. my god, was it on so the? It was, was like it, it was out of the way. It was, it was on the lower level. Bottom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was also the only tank that had salt in it. Yeah. Uh, so of course the excellent conductor of electricity. Yeah. Know. So that yeah. was our last. Fish alarm situation. Yeah. Oh, Feeder wow. nerd to the rescue. Yep. Oh wow. All right. So then now we can let's let's jump on our segue to the super happy topic of <laughs> <laughs> of AGA. Yeah. So um, so Eric, you are very involved with AGA. Right. And here in Seattle, we have the the honor of hosting AGA convention 2019 right so why don't you talk about so first off tell us what aga is um and then talk about what the aga convention is all about okay i'll try to keep it short aga is the aquatic gardeners association it is it's the 10 o'clock bird sorry on the bird clock here you hear something for you to edit oh, out very, no no we're leaving we're leaving that in <laughs> We love our Audubon Society bird clock. That's the human okay. touch right there. <laughs> um, but, but it is above a super awesome cylindrical tank, right? It is a really, this, is a, this is a prototype tank that one of our friends in the hobby gave us. There was a guy up in Seattle who used to make these really unusually shaped tanks. He had a pizza oven and he sold them to fish stores here. And this was his attempt to go into boring tanks by making straight cylinders and so forth. So this is a prototype of... A tank that a, a friend of ours who worked for him just gave us. Actually, once. we bought it. So, it was my did birthday. Did we buy it? You bought it for my birthday. Oh, oh that's a, what is it like? Forty-five. It's about forty-five. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like a two by two, two foot diameter, two foot high. Yeah, it's been through a lot. <laughs> I don't know, I feel pretty special. That right I, just, now, I just eyeballed it and was like, that's 45 right now it's gallons. Gonna, and yeah. it is. <laughs> right now we're housing um, uh, Nymphaea, oh, now I've forgotten the name, Minuta, uh, a lily from Madagascar that Crystal Councilman, who will be speaking at the AGA convention, yeah, yeah. Um, turned us on to. And um, I think it trying, likes the tank. It likes the it's tank. It's huge. No, we, we, it's, it's the, pri the prime specimen in that tank um, because it's the mother plant and I'm trying to reproduce it and get it out in the hobby as much as possible. Oh, awesome. So, um, anyway. <laughs> so, AGA. AGA tank, back to AGA. AGA tank, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, AGA is the Aquatic Gardeners Association, and it is the only U.S. Um, sort of nationwide aquatic plant society. It's actually an international organization, but it's the only one of its kind uh, based out of the U.S., and it has been around since the 1980s, although in the it's in its second incarnation, which started like in 1991 or so. And um, yeah, and, and it's kind of, it's an interesting organization. I've been in it for about as long as I've been in the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. And we've gotten to sort of watch the hobby change over the last 25 to 30 years as, you know, aquascaping was a gleam in people's eyes when, when the AGH first started and now it's like become overcome with it. And um, so the AGA, um, it has uh, a quarterly publication that we put out uh, called The Aquatic Gardener. And that's a little full color 44 page uh, magazine and it, uh, we put on a yearly aquascaping contest that was um, the first uh, sort of the current online aquascaping contest. It was another one of those first that we beat Aqua Design Amano by six months. Oh, nice. Even though they don't like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I've, I've personally been doing the technical end of that since it began in 2000. So it's been a long run on that. And, um, and the AGA holds a convention every two years. We've been doing that since 2000. And the convention involves bringing in um, top speakers from around the country and a few from out of the country. And um, 
So we gather all of the plant geeks in one place every two years, rotates around different places in the country, um, get together, listen to some good talks, uh, have a, a whole bunch of uh, vendors, you know, catering to the aquatic plant side of the hobby. Um, there are live demos of aquascaping. There's a couple of workshops we're going to do this year. One is a sort of aquascaping a 15 gallon tank. So 20 people are getting to, to aquascape their own tank and then put it on display for the weekend and then they take it home at the end of the weekend. And um, and there's another whole separate workshop just for Wabi Kusa. And, and on, well actually maybe both, um, both seminars or both workshops, there's actually going to be assistance, right? Like there's going to be... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. The, um, the, the, so the, the Wabi Kusa workshop, which is just immersed, this sort of immersed mud ball thing that, that's kind of become very popular lately, that's going to be put on entirely by the Chicago, Chicago Aquatic Plant Society or CAPS. And that's like Balin Shaw and his group. And they've been doing that for a number of a uh, number of people already. And they kind of have this thing down to a science. They'll give like a little lecture for 15 minutes on, you know, the the philosophy behind Wabi Kusa. And then everybody gets their mud ball to play with and stick a bunch of plants in. Um, and then that also goes on display for the weekend. And then over in the um, the nano, the so-called nano aquascaping workshop, and I hesitate to call it nano because it's 15 gallons. It's not. I don't really consider the one that on nano. the counter over there, the little square, so like five nine gallons. gallons. That's yeah. nano, right? Yeah. Fifteen yeah. gallons. It's pushing substrate it. plants. That's a, that's a pretty, light. That's a, it's a pretty, pretty good meaty size tank. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fifteen. So, um, but that's a good tank to take home. Take home. Though. It is oh, a yeah. really nice yeah. tank to take yeah. home, right? And um, it's already sold out. Unfortunately, oh, nice. you know, those twenty people have already gone and signed up. But um, but everyone can watch, and and that is um. So that workshop is actually mentored. So there's enough people um, who are very experienced in this hobby that are coming to the convention because they all want to hang out and see what's new. Um, There's actually going to be a mentor for every two people. So so 10 experts will be helping out. So these people will have their own personal uh, assistants, their personal mentors to help them uh, figure out the right decisions. Will, will those be will those be closed door sessions? So if somebody missed out on registration, no. will will like the the paying public, if you will, be able to go in and see the cool aquascaping and things everybody? Going on? So so um, anybody can walk into the vendor room uh, even without registration. That that's all open, and so you can see what's going on in the foyer if you just want to kind of see what's what the deal is with the convention. Um, if you pay the the registration is. $59 for members of either GSAS or the AGA. Uh, and there's a non-member rate that includes a free discounted membership as well. Um, so those people will get to see all the lectures and they can they can kibitz. You know, they can sit and look at the aquascaping workshops. Mm-hmm. Basically, we're still going to be adding a few more things in the middle of Friday by the, by the time the convention opens. You can do anything inside any of the rooms. Uh, with the exception of the banquet, that's an extra charge. Mm-hmm. So there's there's an add-on for that. We're going to have an extra talk at the banquet, but but everything else is included in that fee. Yeah, I, I know at least off the top of my head right now, and I apologize if I forget somebody, but at least three guests of this show will be there in the vendor room. So Eric Lucas from Bipet Shrimp will be there. Yep. Um, Sarah with Bills, shrimp. Sarah yep. Bills from Cascadia Aquatics, who's who's local to the Greater Seattle area, um, and Pleco Paradise right. will be coming from Chicago. Those are at least the the three and that Corey, I. And Corey, Corey Co-op. Oh, that guy. Yeah. 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 He's got he's got a he's a platinum sponsor, so he's got like top, top double double booth. Yeah, yeah, so we have to we have to put our heads together and uh and, and the and Pleco folks I think are getting three tables right next to each other. Oh, so they're nice. gonna be Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a whole bunch. Like uh, I think Aqua Forest is signed on. I mean there's gonna be people from all around the country and there's gonna be local people in the vendor room. And the vendor room's actually this is the largest vendor room the AGA has ever had. Um, we blew out the space and had to convert a second room into a vendor room so um it's a double it's double vendor rooms so it's probably three times the number of vendors as we had at the last convention which is crazy you know it's it's like i've been that's awesome that's super exciting well i mean like i've been to every one of these conventions and i can remember where we had like two vendors and and that was it right vendors did like little Talks, mini talks, or micro talks, or, yeah. or just talked about something they were really passionate about, or that they were presenting or had yep. available. I'll be doing just, that again. I actually really enjoyed them. Eric videotaped some of them, and I enjoyed seeing those. Oh, very cool. Right. And so, what are the what's the dates for AGA? So the the it's May second to the fifth, twenty 
2019. And second is a Thursday. And so Thursday is going to be, yeah, four days. Wow. So, well, it's, yeah. So the, the, the <laughs> Thursday night is not really too much. There'll be people hanging around. Um, I don't know. I don't think we have the vendor room open Thursday is night. Is that the banquet? Is so, Are we doing the banquet? No, dinner? banquet's on Saturday night. Okay. So Thursday night is the field trip, which is unfortunately all sold out already as well. There, there's going to be some people getting to go to the Amazon spheres and it's a guided, it's going to be a guided tour by the horticulturists there, which is kind of cool. Never heard of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, and that, Karen Randall was out here in, in earlier this year speaking to our club, and she was just like, oh, this is so cool. I could spend so, all day I here. I could spend all day yeah. here, exactly. But um, So that's just Thursday. So most people won't be arriving until Friday. Friday is Aquascaping Friday. So um, Friday morning is going to be the, um, the Wabi Kusa workshop, first, first thing. And, um, and then in the afternoon, there will be a demo by um, uh, Dennis Wong. From uh, he's he's got YouTube stuff, mm-hmm. you know? but he's um, he's going to be aquascaping one of those fifteen gallon tanks, and that's going to segue right into the aquascaping um, workshop where everybody tw- twenty other people are going to aquascape the exact same tank. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting to see like what the expert comes up with, and then, and oh, then what so, all of, so the idea the is that they do try to copy I, it. Yeah. Well, I don't yeah. know if they're going to copy it, but they're going to have the same canvas to paint on, mm. right? So they'll have the same they'll have the same plants available um, overall. Um, there's we usually get a big giant donation of plants from Florida Aquatic Nurseries and um, I think Tropica as well, and they will. Yeah, they have a huge palette to work from. So everybody gets to choose kind of differently. And there'll be different hardscape. We had uh, a fellow in our club got us up into the North Cascades. We collected a bunch of rocks last summer for for hardscape materials. And, and so so that all happens Friday night. And the, the whole day Friday, the vendor room is open. So there's, you know. And Dennis Wong is an international aquascaper, very right. well He's known. He's compa- competed phenomenal. in the ADA yeah. and AGA aquascaping contests. Uh, um, so that's all Friday. It's, it's very aquascaping centered. And no, no other talks other no than talks like the. No talks yet, okay. but that might change. We're looking to see if we can squeeze a few more things in the middle of the day for people. That's also kind of a good breathing space for people to, to mingle, hang out. Visit the vendor rooms. Go maybe check out some of the excellent local stores that we have, uh, and so forth. Some people like to do their own kind of um, guy, you know, their own tours. Uh, and then Saturday is just packed the entire day. So there's five different speakers. We've got um, Dennis Wong again. He'll do a lecture on Saturday. We got Crystal Castleman as the keynote. We've got Corey is going to come and do a talk. Um, uh, Kara Wade is going to speak on paludariums, and Vin Cuddy, who we know from the cichlid world, uh, who has become like a massive plant geek in the last few years, he's going to talk about some experiments he's been doing with Rotala oh, nice. and uh, you know, nutrient, nutrient deficiencies, deficiencies and so yep. forth. And will, so, are these talks going to be like two different rooms in parallel with each other? One or at a time. Oh, all serious. excellent. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, that's great. Right? So Aquatic Experience, they had basically had, I think, up to three rooms at any yeah. given time, and it's like you have to pick and choose. Right. I, I, and it's like, ah, I want to Some I people hear like both that, of those. But like the AGA board is not a fan of that. I'm not and a fan of that. NAC the, does that. And it's cool, but Eric and I would always split right. and go to two different rooms. And there was always something really cool I was mm-hmm. missing as well as something I was seeing. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Kind, I'm kind of glad it for is, my first AGA that although yeah, I, I don't I will be attending AGA in a different capacity than just somebody right. going for like, you know, grins and giggles. So yeah. we'll yeah. see how many of those talks I'll be able to steal away for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's a room. It's always a problem. A for hospitality the room. You know, one right. of my favorite parts about conventions is that you get to go and meet and talk with these people from all around the world. I mean, not just the United States. That's right. And uh, you hang out and you talk plants and you talk fish and hobby and it's a lot of fun and we've made lifelong friends that way. So, so, so you feel like, all right, so it's it's in May. Yep. Uh, we are at late December right now. So yep. that's like a whole, you know, almost a full five months for somebody to, uh, no, more than four. Five. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More like four left. Oh, only... We're we're at the end of December. This is true. It's yeah. about to be January first. This is 1st. true. This yeah. is true. Yeah. All right. There's only four four plus months to get ready for this. But there's still so four months though to plan a trip like this. Uh, I mean, airfare. I always talk about airfare. Right. Super cheap right now. You can fly yeah. across the country for dirt cheap when you're yes. getting good sales yeah. on Delta, Alaska, Alaska wherever you're. Yeah. Where, yeah, we are in Alaska hub in Seattle, yeah. um, the Seattle Tacoma Airport. 
Um, the room, do we still have room rates for Red Lion where it's going to be open? Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. we still have room rates. Um, so if I was, let's say, just you know, a, a solo traveler, right? Yeah. I don't know anybody there, but this sounds like a super awesome event. It sounds like there are going to be people that I can interact with. There's going to be things that I can do, and I just don't have to kind of hermit away and that's walk right. around the vendor booths. Like, th- there's going to be engagement for everybody that attends. Right. Yeah, that's right. And in the hospitality suite, everybody just goes and talks, and there's snacks, and you hang out, and and right. Even free- after the lectures are over, there's still things you feel can do. free to ask questions. I mean, it's not uncommon to have people stay up till 12, 1, 2, 3 a.m. Um, just uh, nerding out. Just on, nerding on out. Just fishing exactly. plants. Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> so what's some people pull a bag? What's this? You know, when a mono <laughs> was there one time, you know, they all went, they got a mono. He wanted Budweiser and they all got him. And Budweiser Jack Daniels. And Jack remember, Daniels. Right? <laughs> and they shut down the hospitality suite. People got to hang out with a mono that night until, I mean, yeah. I was long asleep before it even closed. So, and then yeah. Sunday's an all-day auction. Right. So, and Crystal yeah. Castleman, if you don't know her, she actually wrote what I think is the best planted book out there for Plan ID. And it's Aquarian Plants, and it's a, an amazing book. And she's a plant explorer and goes out and discovers these plants in the wild and brings them back and talks with all the experts in the world. And then her banquet talk is actually part of her travelogue talk. So she's got phenomenal stories. I don't know which one she's going to do, but we were rolling hearing about her travels in Africa and collecting wild plants in Africa and having to sleep up in mm. high places to stay off the ground. And how do you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night with lions on the ground? Oh and my like goodness! That. Yeah, it's, it's it's fascinating stuff. Are so. our tickets to the tickets to the banquet? Are those all sold out? Or are those still available? no banquet's still available? There's um. There's a few. It's gonna. I, I think we will probably sell out of the banquet uh, before we sell out of the rest of the convention. So um, you know, if people are thinking of getting banquet tickets at some point. Better to get it earlier rather than later. I think. Um, f- and it's for our that. cheapest banquet. Usually it they is. run about fifty dollars, and this one's about I thirty-two. Think it's thirty-two. Thirty-two. We've so. never had it. We haven't had a banquet that cheap probably in ten years. Thirty-two yeah. bucks for a dinner, for and dinner. you get to listen to speakers and the extra right. talk. Yeah. yeah. So that, it's that, pretty nice. Yeah, I, I think my lunch today was like thirty some odd dollars with yeah. a drink. I don't. I mean, that sounds like a good. And this yeah. didn't come with like really cool travel talks and all right, sorts of right. stuff like that. Yeah, and then you know we try to mingle. You know, that's the other thing. The banquet you can you never know. You might be at a table and you might be speaking. You know, with Crystal Castleman at the. You know, I I don't know how the tables go, and it's interesting. We try to to distribute all the speakers around to different tables so mm-hmm. that you know people can meet. New friends, and there was know, there's a guy that comes up from Australia all the time, Paul. Would, Paul, and he would just come up and drop in, and we all got to know him over the years. In fact, um, when at the Florida convention, I found out he was a NASA buff too, and so we got tickets to the space shuttle launch. Had an extra one, told him he could have it, and he flew right. up and met us there, all for meeting at aquarium conventions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. super cool! Yeah. yeah. And then, so so let's talk a little bit more about Sunday was an all-day... So Sunday is an all-day auction, so... Open to everyone, no yeah, fee. Yeah, there's no fee for that. Uh, if you want to sell at it, you have to be registered for the convention or pay some nominal fee that we have um, on there. And, yeah, it runs all day. It's probably... L- the last one, I think, had 800 or more lots. Um, so, it, you know, people are used to this kind of thing in Seattle. It's very similar to the general auction that GSAS has, but it's all plant and plant related material so it's it's huge so a lot of the manufacturer donations you know this so these are people like Kessel right or Seachem or Fluval and so forth so Sunday a lot of those things get auctioned off or you know Florida Aquatic Nurseries all the plants that were used the ones that didn't go into the aquascapes are all auctioned off and so it's it's a really great opportunity even for people who don't go to the don't attend the convention it's a great opportunity to pick up a you know good score on plants take so, take a swag at the number of items that people could expect to potentially be able to bid on 800, 800. i think it might be it, it might it'll probably break that would be my guess wow so based on the vendor turnout I think we're going to break records this and, year. And that could extend how long in the day how long do you think it's going to take us to auction um, off over this could be items? like a five hour thing or more. five or hours more. that's yeah. awesome it could be i mean depending you know we have a really good auctioneer and he goes pretty fast right and um but those plant names are sometimes a little hard to pronounce so maybe we, we may need to have plant person we so. may need to have like a like a, a color man pronouncing plants up there but 
But if we keep things moving pretty fast, we can we can move them. And it's sort quick. of always interesting to find out what the star of the action is. Yes, because there's always a rare aquatic plant that everyone wants and drools over, and you'll see people clustered around it and right. looking. And do do you have like maybe one off the top of your head from two, last uh, the previous one or, oh, or one year was I mean you know we're talking twenty years ago. Sure, Blossom sure. stigma was one of them. Okay, you know, or a new ver- variant of Java. Yeah, Pogo Java and Helferi when it first oh, came. Pogo Seaman was, was, was one of those sixty dollars for a or bunch of that. Wow, yeah. Sunset Crip, one hundred and fifty dollar plant oh, for the Florida Sunset. Yeah, yeah, the Florida Sunset Crip when it first came out. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. and there was so. you know a Java fern variant that Amano had never seen that also went really. Oh yeah, if you get somebody's name attached to it, like you know. Right, like this is the Castleman lily, you know, people are interested in that, or, yeah. oh, Amano breathed on this plant, so, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. But, um, the last convention, 2017, we actually broke my software because the, the demo tank went for, I believe, like $1,200. And I'm not expecting that to happen. I, I, I hope that it doesn't happen. You only plan for a certain number of digits well, in the pl- I only had three digits, exactly. <laughs> I could not go above nine hundred ninety nine dollars um, on the you know for the bid, so we actually had to split it into two different items. And uh, yeah, so that was that's the thing I remember the most from the twenty seventeen convention. Yeah, they sell the so. demo tanks. It's like Y two K, but for your auction it was software. Like, it was it was like that. Yeah. Did it? Yeah, I could imagine seeing you so like super flustered that that happened. That one didn't but didn't bug me. What, no, okay. what, what freaked me out was when the um, when we had like three identical items went one after another. They, they were like tissue culture specimen specimens, all of the same species. For some reason, the runners all grabbed the same thing, and there was a bug in the software where both recorders picked the same item to record and it it kind of blew everything up at the same time doesn't do that now we got that fixed <laughs> that was the stressor the 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 uh the super expensive tank was more like well this is an interesting problem to have that's a good this like, is a, this is the a most problem excellent problem have. we've yeah. had the entire convention yeah. so, so how many digits now can we go up to in our auction software i think we still have to split it into two items oh you did, oh you didn't i don't want sure. i'll have to go check that we should be we, did, we should be um, like uh, assumptive, like wishfully assumptive, and have yeah. like five digits. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have a five-digit item go for sale. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's it's always interesting to see how it goes. So oh, excellent! It'll be that'll be a big day. And, yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to uh, this. Will be my first AGA convention, and it'll be so cool to go to a fish event that is down the road, right? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. For, for for us, you know. But I I would still highly encourage everybody to come out that can um, to this event and experience it. Um, I know Corey is dead set on doing something wild, doing something crazy, and just making yeah. this an awesome experience for people. So um, interested to put our heads together and see what uh, what we end up coming with for that. Um, looking so, forward to that. <laughs> Yeah. Some of the descriptions you've given me sound like a three-ring circus. It's going to be very interesting. <laughs> so how can people find out more about um, about AGA and this convention? And I'll make sure that I have show, links in the show notes sure thing. as well. Um, the convention, we have our own website specifically for the convention. That's AGA2019.com. Uh, so AGA2019.com. And uh, the AGA itself, you can find information by going to aquatic-gardeners.org. Um, and... There's also a link to the annual aquascaping contest where we have all 19 years worth of results on display, right? And you can find information about um, joining the AGA and so forth from that. Oh, I think it'd be cool to go back and just see how the, the competition has progressed, like the different Absolutely. styles and like what won, you know, 10 years ago versus what wins Absolutely. now. That would be, I think I needed, I've it, got my it, laptop right here. It, it is really interesting to go look for that, how it's changed. I mean, because the... You, you could you could do an entire podcast just on the aquascaping contest because it's you know started out with like maybe a um, hundred entries or something like that mostly U.S. based and right now they're at it's like five to six hundred entries on on our contest alone. Wow! And and they're all highly polished, right? These are people that do this stuff for a living. A lot of them, so it's it's kind of interesting. It's very yeah. Very cool. As the yeah. GSAS speaker coordinator, I'm like, that sounds like a great talk. <laughs> Maybe you could work on that. 
<laughs> and I and I love feeding you suggestions on. Hey, I think this person yeah. is pretty good I in an interview. I think I think we might need to bring them up right. here. I like that. I like getting the podcast interviewees as speakers. So I, I will say a huge thank you again. One, thank you for for letting me into your house. Um, not a complete stranger, but you know, yeah. nonetheless, thanks for letting me in the house to record this interview with you guys. It's been absolutely fantastic, and, and just a huge thank you again for everything you do for GSAS and for this hobby at large. Um, and I say the hobby at large because you know, hopefully, people that join GSAS get more people involved, right? And that they That's have such a, they have yeah. such a positive experience um, because of the work you guys are doing, you know, behind the scenes, um, you know, with this work on work um, within the club, but then work outside of the club with AGA and putting on this convention, which is no, I mean, it's not something that you just wake up and say, hey guys, we're doing this, everything's planned, we're good to go. Like this has been <laughs> what are we like a few months now in the making, right? At least. Oh, it's been a year. Okay. It's, it's about a year ago that, that we started coming up with everything. Yeah, yeah cuz so. well some of the first conversations were when I joined the board. Yep. Okay, jeez, time flies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> time Amazing, flies right? when you have fun <laughs> with fish, yeah. I guess. So guys, thank you so much again for coming on. I really really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed having you on. I Thanks, enjoyed Randy. it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.